Hello, I'm Alex and welcome to the History Chronicles. If you like our work, then please don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you'd like to support the channel in return for exclusive perks, please visit our Patreon page. Now, on with the video. What is the significance of the Palace of Versailles? Who built it? And who lived there? Let's find out in today's episode of the History Chronicles. Today's History Chronicle begins on the 5th of October 1789 in the city of Paris. On that day, some five months after the beginning of the French Revolution, a large crowd of Parisians who were tired of rising bread prices and the economic crisis gripping the French capital, marched to the Royal Palace of Versailles outside the capital. The following day, they forced King Louis XVI and Queen Marie Antoinette to relocate to Paris itself. This was a key moment in the French Revolution, one which saw the return of the royal government to Paris after over a hundred years in exile at Versailles. Here we look at how the Palace of Versailles came to be the seat of the French government and its extensive history. For centuries, Paris was the seat of the French monarchy, a position which it gained during the Middle Ages. Here, in the late medieval period and into the early modern period, the Valois dynasty of French kings and, after 1589, the Bourbon dynasty, lived in a number of royal palaces which had been built across the centuries. Notable amongst these was the Louvre Palace, which today is a world-famous museum, but which, between its first construction in the 12th century and the 16th century, was one of the principal residences of the French royal family. Then, from 1564, the newly built Tuileries Palace, adjoining the Louvre, became the home of the Valois royal family, and then the Bourbons. However, this all changed in the 17th century, when it was due to the influence of one man. King Louis XIV, who ascended to the French throne as a child in 1643 and only died in 1715, was not just one of Europe's longest-serving monarchs, he was also a staunchly absolutist king, one who tried to cultivate the idea of himself as a quasi-deity. However, he was also psychologically scarred. As a child, he had witnessed violent protests against the French monarchy on the streets of Paris, the so-called Fronde. As a consequence, he decided later in his life to move the royal court away from Paris, and to that end, he ordered the construction of a brand new grand palace outside the city at Versailles. Versailles was located in the countryside, some 20 kilometres outside of Paris itself. It had previously been the site of a royal hunting lodge, but in 1661, Louis ordered the construction of a vast new royal residence there. It was designed by the acclaimed classical Baroque architect Louis Laveau, and would take over 50 years for construction to be completed. However, the core of the palace was sufficiently advanced in its construction by 1682, over 20 years after the project was initiated, for Louis and the royal court to move in. The king proclaimed it as his primary residence, and as such, it would remain, until the Parisian mob dragged his great-great-grandson and his family back to Paris 107 years later. The palace consisted of a three-sided building surrounding a courtyard, around which apartments for the royal family and other members of the court were located. Most spectacular, however, were the gardens, which were designed by the famed French landscape architect André Le Nôtre. These were heavily embellished, with fountains, Italian-style grottos, statues, geometric flower beds, groves of trees, orchards, and even a zoo, while a large canal added an almost lake-like dimension to the palace grounds. Most of this was completed by the 1680s, when the court was relocated to the palace. The interior contained numerous apartments and reception rooms, which were designed to convey the majesty of Louis's monarchy to the visitors to Versailles. The most famous is the Hall of Mirrors. This was the central gallery of the palace, running across the north side and connecting the west and east wings. The hall consisted of 17 mirror-clad arches that reflected the 17 arcaded windows that overlooked the gardens. Each arch contains 21 mirrors, with a total complement of 357 mirrors used in the decoration of the hall. As we will see, the Hall of Mirrors would become the stage for some of Europe's most significant political events over the centuries. The wider apartments were just as extensive and grand. The royal apartments were in the very heart of the palace, adjoining the Hall of Mirrors. Some of these were heavily decorated with opulent scenes depicting the gods and goddesses of classical Greek and Roman mythology. The idea being to present the royal family in a quasi-deified fashion. All of this was in keeping with Louis XIV's wider efforts to represent himself as the Sun King throughout France through representations of himself in statues and on French coinage. 
Subsequent wings included scores of rooms for esteemed members of the royal court and even a royal theatre or opera and a chapel. The palace at Versailles was laid out over a space of over 1,000 hectares or over 2,500 acres. Given that this had become the seat of the government by the 1680s, one which housed the royal family as well as hundreds of courtiers and government officials, it is unsurprising to learn that a town began to emerge outside the grounds of the new palace, where the thousands of administrative officials and servants who worked at Versailles lived. The distance of the palace from Paris precluded such individuals from living in the capital at the time, and the service village of Versailles expanded quickly to a population of as many as 60,000 people by the time of the French Revolution in 1789. The royal court remained embedded at Versailles for the remainder of Louis XIV's long reign, and most of those of his immediate successors, Louis XV and Louis XVI. As the seat of one of the most powerful nations in Europe, and a global colonial power at the time, it consequently became the site of many significant political and diplomatic events. For instance, in 1783 the final treaties which established the Peace of Paris the series of treaties which brought the American Revolutionary War to a conclusion and secured the independence of France's ally, the United States, from Britain, were signed at Versailles by an American delegation led by Benjamin Franklin. The French Revolution profoundly changed the situation, however, as following the aforementioned removal of Louis XVI and his family and government to Paris in October 1789, the palace ceased to serve as the seat of government and Paris once again became the administrative capital of France. Moreover, following the trial and executions of Louis and his wife in 1793 by an increasingly radical republican government, much of the furnishings and artworks of the palace were removed and sold off at auction. The palace was repurposed as an art school, and the nearby town of Versailles rapidly declined in numbers to just 25,000 people, less than half its previous extent within a decade or so. But it was not the end for Versailles. Napoleon refurbished the palace and even considered moving there once he had been proclaimed as France's first emperor. But he eventually decided against a move, which would be too closely associated with the old monarchy, as did several of his successors. Then, King Louis Philippe in the 1830s began renovating Versailles for use as a grand museum and a ceremonial building, which functions it would serve for decades to come. For instance, the Royal Opera at Versailles was used by Napoleon III to host Britain's Queen Victoria during a state visit in August 1855. Two events above all others, though, are synonymous with Versailles in the modern era, and these bookend the beginning and the end of the Second German Reich. In the 1860s, the greatest of the German states, Prussia, led by Otto von Bismarck, had begun to unify Germany by tying the 30 or so states and duchies, into which the country was divided, into a grand alliance. Then, through two wars with Denmark and Austria in 1864 and 1866, he expanded the power of this alliance of German states one final target remained. Bismarck had designs on securing parts of eastern France, and so Prussia went to war with its western neighbour in the summer of 1870. The Franco-Prussian War was a very brief affair, in which the French were comprehensively defeated within a few months, and surrendered in January 1871 after a siege of Paris. What followed is one of the defining moments of European history. Versailles was now occupied and used as a headquarters for the German army in France, Consequently, it was here that the Prussian ruler Wilhelm I was formally proclaimed as the Emperor of a German Empire, the Second German Reich, on the 18th of January 1871, unifying Germany into a single state for the first time in modern history. The ceremony took place in the Hall of Mirrors. Perhaps fittingly, it was at Versailles 48 years later that the treaty which brought the First World War to a formal end was signed. The Second German Reich had ceased some months earlier when Wilhelm II had abdicated and a new German Republic was proclaimed. But the Treaty of Versailles concluded the peace terms between Germany and its opponents, particularly France and Britain. The treaty was again signed in the Hall of Mirrors on the 28th of June 1919 at Versailles, but its implications would cast a long shadow. So punitive and humiliating were the reparations and other terms imposed on Germany by the victors that resentment over it in Germany facilitated the rise of the Nazis several years later. The Palace of Versailles continued to occupy a prominent place in French life in the century since these extraordinary events of the 19th and early 20th centuries. In the late 1920s, the American business magnate John D. Rockefeller donated millions of dollars towards the refurbishment of the palace and further work over the decades through to the 1950s, aimed to restore the palace as near as possible 
to how it might have looked during its heyday under Louis XIV and his direct successors in the 18th century, work which was hampered in 1978 when the palace was damaged as part of a terrorist bombing campaign undertaken by Breton separatists. Despite this latter setback, the Palace of Versailles today stands as grand as it ever has in modern times. An innovative campaign was undertaken in recent decades to reacquire some of the original furnishings which were auctioned off in the 1790s and restore them to the palace. The Grand Versailles project was also undertaken in 2003 in order to replant the gardens after the loss of thousands of trees during a hurricane during the 1990s. An extensive project to restore the Hall of Mirrors to its full grandeur was also brought to a conclusion in 2006, marking significant progress in the modern restoration of the palace. Today the Palace of Versailles is under state ownership and primarily functions as a museum. Over 10 million tourists visit there every year to view the palace, the elaborate gardens and the many exhibitions which are staged in the palace. Versailles is also still used for major state occasions in France. For instance, in 2009, President Nicolas Sarkozy staged a major meeting of heads of state and finance ministers there, at which responses to the global financial crisis were discussed and debated. Thus, over a 340-year period since Louis XIV first moved there, the Palace of Versailles has been the site of some of Europe's most extraordinary events and gatherings of world leaders. You've been watching the History Chronicles. We'd love to know what you think of the Palace of Versailles. Please let us know below, and if you enjoyed our video, please give us a like and subscribe. It really helps us out. Also, if you'd like to support our work going forward, please visit our Patreon page. And we look forward to seeing you again on the next episode of the History Chronicles.